picking it back up in the book of Lamentations, and if you have your Bibles, I'd like to ask that you turn with me to uh, Lamentations chapter 3. We're going to be in Lamentations chapter 3. Right after the big book of Jeremiah, we uh, enter into Lamentations chapter 3 this morning. Um, And uh, if you have notes there, I want to make sure you're awake. You're going to be taking a lot of notes today um, as we track through this uh, fantastic chapter, Lamentations chapter 3. I wanted to open us up with a comment that Swindoll makes in his commentary. And, and I think it's a, a very helpful comment that he has here, and I think it'll get us started in the right direction as we begin in Lamentations chapter 3. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, he, he writes this in his commentary, When we suffer loss, it is only natural for us to grieve And in our emptiness and sorrow, it is also normal that we focus for a time on ourselves and on our misery. However, if our attention continues to be directed inward, we will have a mixture of, if only I had, I remember when, if I knew then what I know now, and why, why, why. He goes on here, soon guilt, bitterness, Self-degradation and even self-justification will lead to an emotional tailspin that could permanently scar or ruin a life, sometimes tragically ending in suicide. Where is God in all of this? Does he abandon us when we fall on bad times? Well, as I believe that as we open up to this third chapter today, the answer to Swindoll's question is a resounding no. Uh, He doesn't abandon us when we go through difficult times. God does not abandon us when we go through hard times. However, hard times can come for a number of reasons. God can permit hard times to come into our lives as believers in order to grow us spiritually. That would be one of the reasons why he might allow one of his children to go through a a season of difficulty. Uh, God can permit hard times to come into our lives in order to test us for his purposes. But it's also true that God can permit hard times to come into our lives in order to discipline us. And the doctrine of chastisement or divine discipline is clearly seen all throughout Scripture. And the teaching of it reaches even into this this church age of grace. For instance, in the Old Testament, we read in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 32, the following. He who neglects discipline despises himself... But he who listens to reproof acquires understanding. Divine discipline is designed to grow us and to teach us. However, David said in Psalm chapter 38, O Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath, and chasten me not in your burning anger. When divine discipline comes, it can come for different purposes, and it can come in different levels of intensity. In fact, in the New Testament, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, speaking of divine discipline there in the context, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. When God chooses to discipline his children, there are some major positive effects that can take place as well as lessons learned. But in the moment... It isn't very fun. We're going to see that in the beginning part of chapter 3. It isn't very fun in the moment. And it isn't fun because there are negative things that can transpire. In fact, as we're going to be looking at God's chastisements today, we're going to find this truth in the first 22 verses of Lamentations chapter 3. This is the truth that I believe we will see here in the first 22 verses. When one comes under the divine discipline of the Lord... It should be obvious to them, and it should cause them to seek his forgiveness. When one comes under the divine discipline of the Lord, it should be obvious to them, and it should cause them to seek his forgiveness. Now, within these first few verses, it will become very clear to Jeremiah that God's chastisements have hit the Jewish nation, and he recognizes that even he had been faithful to God personally as a Jew living after the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah also recognizes that these negative chastisements are felt on a national level. You'll, you'll note that. He, he puts himself on the same level as every Jew in that generation, however. In fact, later on in this, 
this chapter, you'll see it in chapter 3, verse 42. He says there, we have transgressed and rebelled. And you'll see he puts himself there on the same, same level as his people. We, we have transgressed and rebelled. Now, we need to understand that even though uh, we are going to be looking at God's divine chastisements in our time at the start of chapter 3, there is a section that we are closing in on which reveals the grace and the, the mercy of our God in a huge way. In fact, the Bible Knowledge Commentary states it so well. I love what it says here. This chapter, chapter 3, gives the book a positive framework around which the other chapters revolve. The black velvet of sin and suffering in chapters 1 and 2 and 4 and 5 serves as a fitting backdrop to display the sparkling brilliance of God's loyal love in chapter 3. Now we know that the book of Lamentations is made up of 722 verse poems. You guys remember that, right? <laughs> it's been a bit since we've been in this book. 722 verse poems. And because of this compilation, the book lays out like a pyramid with verses 23 through 44 at the very top of the structure. And it is that in the midst of tremendous grief and sorrow, God's faithfulness is truly on full display. And we need to remember that as we carefully walk through this book, we are like pilgrims, if you will, walking up a mountain. And before we arrive at the top of the mountain, there are going to be some difficult realities that we find in the Word of God. And, and I believe that what we find here at the very beginning of chapter 3 is one, would be one of those, a, a very difficult reality. It, it speaks to the rod of God's wrath. It's there. You'll note it. And so from our text today, we're going to discover 19 attributes of the rod of God's wrath from this text. We're going to note 19 attributes in our time together uh, that relate to the rod of God's wrath. When the rod of God's wrath comes against his own people, these characteristics of that rod were literally felt. They were felt by Jeremiah as he shared in the quandary of the nation. In fact, these negative attributes were experienced by the Jews when Jerusalem fell, and, and he shares in, in this experience. However, if God's children do not deal with personal sin in their lives, then these attributes of God's wrath could become a part of their reality. And so in the specific context of this chapter, as God's people would experience the rod of God's wrath, these Attributes of his rod were within the context aimed at the Jewish nation. They were aimed at the, the Jewish nation. If God were to choose to chastise church age believers who have lived a perpetual lifestyle of sin and, and have not repented of that sin, then you had better believe that God can send negative chastisement judgments into their lives as well. And so it is worth it. Uh, for the church today to study a chapter like this out of the Old Testament because not only is it a part of God's word, but it, is, it also helps us to see that if we don't deal with sin in our lives, then the rod of God's wrath just might come against us for the purpose of correction. I think that Swindoll's title from chapter 2 could carry over into chapter 3. And the title that he gave for chapter 2 was Words from the Woodshed. You remember, Words from the Woodshed. We kind of get a glimpse into that again in the first part of chapter 3 here. All right, well, we have 19 attributes uh, before us today that will give us some insight into this rod that God used against his own people in the, in the Old Testament. And the first attribute that we find in this passage is that this rod was used by God on those who belong to him. And we see that in verse 1. It was used by God on those who belong to him. Verse 1 says, I am the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. Now Jeremiah is explaining here that God has used a certain type of rod against his own people that brought with it great affliction. And the Hebrew word used here for rod in this verse describes an instrument or device made of wood or metal. The same word for rod is also found in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, which says, He who withholds his rod hates his son. 
but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. That was, in essence, what God was doing here. Jeremiah recognized that God was using a certain type of rod, which he refers to as the rod of God's wrath. And this rod was used against the Jewish nation. The second attribute is that the rod did not bring with it joy. You'll note that in verse 2. The rod did not bring with it joy. He says here, He has driven me and made me walk and in darkness and not in light. When God's people get out of fellowship with God, God can actually cause them to go through a season of gloom and doom where there is a major lack of joy. It happens. Jeremiah describes that the Jews were forced to stumble in the darkness. God's hand of favor became a fist of adversity. I shared in a board meeting that there is a real sense of joy a couple months ago that, that comes when you are in the center of God's will. There just is. There's a huge sense of joy. But, but on, the, on the other side of the coin, it can be a very scary place to be when a believer no longer senses God's leading and direction because of unconfessed sin and an unrepentant heart. That brings us to the third attribute this morning. The rod was felt all the time. Verse 3, the rod was felt all the time. Just imagine walking through life apart from the joy that God gives. As if you're walking in darkness all the time. He, ex- he explains that here. Surely against me he has turned his hand repeatedly all the day. And what Jeremiah is expressing here is this feeling of perpetual adversity that is coming to him by the very hand of God and it is relentless. Uh, there was a moment in King David's life where he came under, um, I believe, divine discipline. He traveled the path of carnality. If you read First Samuel uh, chapter 27 through chapter 30, verse 6, um, he, he, he gets on this path of carnality. And you will not find this man who is referred to in the scripture as a man after God's own heart. You will, you will not find him... Uh, resting on the promises of God in that season of life, you won't find it. He isn't on his knees before God in prayer. In fact, you won't find a single psalm written by him when for a season David traveled the path of carnality. Why was that? It was because when David was on this path of carnality, God's hand of favor became a fist of adversity that pushed him towards a desperate, hopeless, helpless circumstance where all he could do was look to God. And you can read of that account in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now, of course, that was in David's instance because he was on the path of carnality. God can allow his, his children who are walking with him or in fellowship with Christ to go through difficult seasons uh, for, the per, for the reason for um, personal growth as well. Well, Jeremiah says that this rod was felt all the time. It didn't let up. You see that which was unfortunate because the rod affected his physical health. Verse 4, it affected his physical health. It says here, He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones. Um, God can actually cause his children to become weak and sick because they refuse to deal with their sins before God. Because of the fact that some of the Corinthian believers refuse to deal with their own sins, Paul writes 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. He's not saying they're physically sleeping. Some of them are dying. God is taking them out of the picture. That would be one of the reasons for um, div- divine chastisement. And it, is it any wonder why we find in this fifth I- attribute that the rod became a burden? It became a burden, verse 5. It says here, he has besieged and encompassed me with bitterness and hardship. Notice that this bitterness and hardship that Jeremiah and the Jews experienced came from the hand of God. It wasn't an accident, nor was it a mistake. That brings us to the sixth attribute. The rod put him in a fatal place. It put him in a fatal place. Verse 6 says, in dark places he has made me to dwell like those who have long been dead. Pastor David Thompson made a great observation here. He, he says here that when a believer sins against God, there will be a darkness and a gloominess and a deadness to life until that sin is resolved. 
Kind of funny that sin isn't advertised that way. Satan would have us to believe that sin is fun and, and good in its own way. But for God's people, we need to always factor in the reality that we just might come under the rod of God's discipline for choosing to reject his clear will. That brings us to the seventh attribute. The rod provided no way of escape. Verse 7, it provided no way of escape. It says here, he has walled me in so that I cannot go. He has made my chain heavy. And Jeremiah felt as though there was no way of escape. It was as if God had put up a, a wall around him, had chained him down to the ground. And keep in mind here, Jeremiah knew what it was like to be in a prison cell. <laughs> we just studied the life of Jeremiah, his ministry. He knew what that was like. He knew what it was like to be mistreated. He was thrown into a pit. You remember that. But the experience of this rod of God's wrath was so much more worse. And that leads us to the eighth attribute for God's wrath. The rod affected communication with God. Verse 8. The rod affected communication with God. It says, even when I cry out and call for help, he shuts out my prayer. The Hebrew verb for shut out is only found one time in the Bible, and it means to stop the prayer. Now, the prayer was given by Jeremiah. He says in his own words, I cried out and I called out, but... What God is doing is he is actually preventing the prayer from reaching his ears. This is a very real indication that we are not in a right relationship with the Lord. We are not in a right relationship with God when he doesn't answer our prayers. If we think that we can live in sin and refuse to deal with our own personal sin, then we will certainly have a major negative impact then that will have a major negative impact on our fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that brings us to um, the, next, <laughs> the next attribute here. Sam's going to get that back up for you. Which is that the rod negatively impacted the quality of living. That would be attribute number nine, Sam. The rod negatively impacted the quality of living. Now this is obviously true as Jeremiah continues to give these attributes of the rod of God's wrath. In verse 9, we read, He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. I remember um, at Frontier School of the Bible one evening um, as college students, uh, some of the guys in the dorm, what we did was we would put on these um, skiing goggles and it kind of distorted your view and so we were trying to run in a straight line down the hallway to no avail we'd run into the walls it was it was funny it was funny that that's the picture that jeremiah is describing here except when god makes your paths crooked that can be a scary thing that can be a scary thing. In fact, a carnal believer won't know which way is up and which way is down. A carnal believer won't, make a, won't have assurance in life that God is guiding them as they navigate through life. In fact, a, a carnal believer will fail to make accurate God-honoring decisions in life that are found in his word because sin will drive one away from the word and from the desire to want to know what God's will is for them. Uh, Dwight... Al Moody once said this, and I think it's so good. The Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. With, without the assurance that you are on the right path in life, that can be a very scary thing. That brings us to the tenth attribute. The rod was threatening. It was threatening, verse 10. Uh, Jeremiah acknowledged that as he and the nation of Israel had undergone the, the rod of God's wrath, God actually became a predator instead of a protector and this idea of a predator is seen in two different pictures here verse 10 he says he is to me like a bear lying in wait like a lion in the secret places this picture of a predator is viewed from the angle of a, a bear and a lion and if you go out for a walk in the woods and you happen to stumble upon a bear it'll get your adrenaline going right at least I can speak for myself I know that that brings us to the 11th attribute. The rod was destructive. It was destructive. Verse 11. He has turned aside my ways and torn me to pieces. He has made me desolate. The, the terror caused by the lion and the bear leads the victim towards being torn into pieces. And that leads us into that fifth attribute or that 12th 
set him up like a target. So we move from this picture of a predator to a, a hunter here, verse 12. says, he bent his bow and he set me as a target for the arrow. A, a carnal believer that is continually living in carnality will feel as though God is aiming his arrows of divine judgment right at them. That leads us to the 13th attribute. The 13th attribute is the rod will not allow him to have peace. He will not have peace. Jeremiah writes here, He made the arrows of his quiver to enter into my inward parts. And Jeremiah is describing here that he, along with the Jews, did not have rest. They only had unrest. Their condition was one of great chaos. The, fourth attri- the 14th attribute, the 14th attribute, the rod negatively impacted his relationships. Verse 14, I have become a laughing stock to all my people. They're mocking song all the day. If a carnal believer does not deal with sin in their life, then their testimony for the Lord can literally become a joke in the eyes of the world. Jeremiah just states here that in his turmoil, he is still a laughing stock. Jeremiah became a laughing stock that other nations would look at and and would give their own taste of disapproval. That 15th attribute, the rod filled his life with bitter things. Verse 15, he has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunk with wormwood. One of my reference, one of my resources in Logos describes this wormwood the following way. It's a very unpleasant substance to consume which may make one sick. Another described it as being potentially one of the most uh, poisonous substances that you could drink in Judah at that time. So we move from beverages to then the appetite, which leads us directly into the 16th attribute. And that 16th attribute is that the rod caused me to be fearful. Verse, he has made me cower in the dust. When a believer chooses to live in carnality, then that can absolutely lead one to being fearful of what God will do. I, earlier I mentioned David in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 27. If you read of that time of carnality, when he gets on that path of carnality in David's life, what's interesting is that that season of carnality begins with fear. David actually fears King Saul. Uh, and he woke up one day thinking that the king was going to take his life, which prompted him to make a series of very ungodly decisions. When, well, the Jewish nation living in Judah during the days of Jeremiah had learned the hard way that the rod also caused no happiness. Verse 17, it caused no happiness. My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. Which follows then, the rod allowed him to feel no hope and no strength. Verse 18, the rod allowed him to feel no hope and no strength in verse 18. So I say my strength has perished, and so has my hope from the Lord. Again, when God's people choose not to deal with sin in their life, it will lead them to a place where they feel alienated from God. Now listen, there's a, there's a powerful principle here when we, when we, as we've looked at these verses If believers refuse to deal with sin, then they will not have hope or strength in life. Where does our hope, where where does our strength come from? (laughs) It comes from the Lord. If you're not in fellowship with him, you're not going to have his, uh, you're not going to have his strength. You won't have his peace. You're going to lack hope there. And that finally leads us to the 19th attribute. When one experiences the rod of God's wrath, there is great hope. So this has been pretty gloomy so far. I think you guys would agree with me on that point. But we're ending on a positive note. When one experiences the rod of God's wrath, there is great hope. Now I'm going to spend some more time on this point in our next lesson because it's so powerful. In the midst of Uh, Being on the receiving end of God's wrath um, wrath after being disciplined by God and experiencing some of his negative, chastising judgments, there remains great hope on the horizon for God's people. 
and, and this section of Lamentations does not end on a, on a negative note, on a positive, rather. Verse 19, and let's read through verse 22 together. And we'll kind of end out our time here. Verses 19 through 22 says, Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease for his compassions. They never fail. Even after receiving these negative judgments from God, the choice that Jeremiah made in the middle of it was to recall and to remember the Lord. So within the acrostic alignment of this book, since chapter 5 is not written in the acrostic form, the very pinnacle of this pyramid rests on verses 22 and 23 in Lamentations chapter 3. So in our next two lessons, we're going to spend some time, and we're actually more than that, we're going to spend a, a couple of lessons here parked on chapter 3. These are some great verses here. The loving kindness of the Lord. We're going to take some time there. The faithfulness of God. We're going to take some time on, on uh, those verses there. And uh, the rest of the chapter is an incredible chapter, really. But listen, I am convinced that these verses are designed to show the reader a couple of things. One is that when it comes to living in carnality, God will allow his judgments to come upon your head unless you deal with your sin before him. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I've never met a carnal believer who is just oozing out joy. <laughs> no, I've never seen it. Never seen it. In our time together, we've learned this truth. When one comes under the divine discipline of the Lord, it should be obvious to them, and it should cause them to seek his forgiveness. We have an important obligation before God to recall to our minds, no matter the season of life in which we find ourselves, we must remember and thank the Lord for his grace, for his mercy. So as the Bible Knowledge Commentary suggests, we are now entering into a new section within Lamentations that displays the uh, sparkling brilliance of God's loyal love. You're going to be encouraged uh, as we continue to walk through this a tremendous book together. Let me pray, and we're going to dismiss out our time. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your great love. Thank you for uh, this tremendous book that helps us to see that you take sin very seriously in the lives of your children. Lord, if any uh, here today or listening online have been out of fellowship with you, I pray that they would see the importance of getting back into fellowship with, with Jesus and walking with him. Father, we, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you for the strength that you give, for the peace that you give. Uh, it is amazing to us, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. As we look back, we can see your hand of faithfulness. Uh, we give you praise. Uh, I pray that you would uh, give us great joy as we go through this week now. In your name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.